Welcome back, everyone. And we get to, sadly, our final session. But we save the best till last, because it's a huge pleasure to be able to welcome Faye Taylor back to Cumberland Lodge. I've known Faye for about a decade um, through involvement in Cumberland Lodge. Um, when I came here six years ago, Faye was what we then had a post called uh, the King George VI um, Postdoctoral Fellow, and Faye had that uh, role. And she was also, when she came here, she was finishing off her PhD. So she's living, living testimony to life beyond the PhD. <laughs> so there we go. So we're looking forward to what you've got to say. And um, over to you, but please welcome Faith. Thank you. Thanks, Ed, and also for the invitation uh, to come to Cumberland Lodge today. It's always a pleasure to be here. Um, and as Ed said, it's good to be a living, breathing example of someone who is still alive 10 years after their PhD <laughs> and employed um, in a really interesting job that I'm going to tell you a bit more about later. So it's really a presentation of um, three parts. Um, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the Association of Commonwealth Universities, who I represent, a little bit about my personal journey from PhD to the ACU, um, but really the majority of the talk will be a answering the essay question, which is why a PhD still matters. And to make sure that you believe me that I will return to this question later, I thought I would start with an example from um, one of our scholars. So uh, one of the things we do at the ACU is we um, have scholarship schemes. And um, Boguma here on the screen is a, co a Commonwealth scholar, has held Commonwealth scholarships from us. But I wanted to tell you her story as a, um, and her impact story with her PhD. So Boguma was a medical doctor. She practiced um, in Cameroon where she was from, um, but she also then took uh, her master's and her PhD in the UK. And her story starts with the story actually of another woman called Celine, who Baguma talks about very inspiringly. Um, and this uh, screenshot here is from a TED talk that Baguma did that you can, you can watch later if you're interested. But she tells the story of Celine in that TED talk. Um, and she's really the inspiration. Uh, she was um, a lady with HIV who had been um, part of a, a drug testing trial in Cameroon for antiretrovirals. Now, when that drug testing um, process or clinical trial finished, um, the pharmaceutical company withdrew and Celine was no longer able to afford the transport to get to the clinic to access any further drugs. So by the time Baguma met her, she was um, very, very ill indeed. Um, and through the work that Baguma did later during her PhD, as well as the, the scientific research she was doing on HIV and, um, and drugs um, to help cure it, she also was thinking in very deep terms about the ethics of research. And uh, since then, she has been on a hugely um, uh, high-profile campaign to try and change the way that pharmaceutical companies do their drug testing in low- and middle-income countries, um, because there are some practices around consent, around um, testing, around finance, and around the way that they withdraw from those trials that ha can be highly damaging in, in the short term. So th the reason it needed someone with a PhD to do that was someone with technical knowledge, with credibility in the scientific field, but also with the ability to communicate to multiple stakeholders, um, to talk to them about not only what the problems were, but what some of the solutions might be. And there will be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of examples including those in this room, but across the world of PhD students or researchers doing something incredible with their research. So that is really the answer to the question, why does a PhD matter at all? So I wanted to start with one of our inspirational stories, um, but there's also some structural answers that I can give you, that, um, give you to that question too that I'll come to later. But first, as promised, a little bit about the ACU. So we are a network of 530 universities across the Commonwealth. Um, and I thought I'd do a little bit of a straw poll in the room. Who um, here is from a Commonwealth country? That's pretty much everyone in the room. Not everyone, about 80%. Um, but that's, um, it's a huge, huge network, obviously, 530 universities in about 50 countries. Um, we have India in the Commonwealth, 1.2 billion people. We have Nauru in the Pacific, 10,000 people population. It's a really interesting um, group of countries who are brought together through shared values. Um, there's no treaties in the Commonwealth. It's all a values-based system. Um, but the point, um, the, the driving point behind it is that every nation has an equal voice. Um, and through such an interesting sort of multilateral organization, you get very different issues 
issues that come to the forefront. And it allows groups of nations to study um, and work on um, very complex issues in a slightly different way than they would do, say, through the G7 or the European Union or something that's based on trade or defence or economics. So it's a, it's a really interesting laboratory of change. And so our universities are, are obviously a core part of that. And you'll see some of the statistics on the screen uh, which show the, the size and reach and scale of, of that network. It's uh, not going to come up brilliantly on this screen, sorry about that, but this is, um, again, a map of the Commonwealth and where all of our universities are based, and you'll see that 66% of our universities, so two-thirds of them, are in low- and middle-income countries in the Commonwealth, 5% in the small states, um, and um, fairly, um, although the numbers look quite different in terms of population size, fairly well spread across the Commonwealth. So what do we believe? What do we do? <laughs> so um, we have a new strategy that's been launched this year, and it's called the Road to 2030, and that is um, because we are pinning everything we do now to the Sustainable Development Goals agenda. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute, but um, it's uh, a, a really useful way of talking across uh, international borders um, in with similar language and similar targets to understand how we might start to work together to, um, to deal with some of the intractable problems that we're faced with globally. We also have a, a new patron this year. So the Queen is patron of Cumberland Lodge, but she also was the uh, patron of the ACU until earlier this year. And she's handed that over to the Duchess of Sussex, which is very nice, because in my previous presentations, in my last job, I used to have to show pictures of Boris Johnson and George Osborne, and now I get to show pictures of the Duchess of Sussex. Uh, but the reason it's important, not only because she is very passionate about the transformational power of higher education, but it really allows us to reach new audiences. So we've done a couple of events with her already, um, and immediately you can start talking about higher education in the main mainstream media in the way that we've really struggled with in the past. So, and it's really important that society also believes us when we say that higher education is important to building a better world, because all of you will be aware of the divisions in society, and universities aren't always people's favourite institutions in that concept. So, the SDGs. Uh, this is another question for the room. How many of you are familiar with the uh, Sustainable Development Goals agenda? Okay, that's good. So most people are. Um, there are 17 of them. Um, as I said, the working towards 2030, there are very specific targets, indicators set against each of these. They're a really useful framework for um, international collaboration. But how many of you have been asked to describe the impact of your current research in uh, the context of the Sustainable Development Goals? Yeah, it's a smaller number. I can see about four or five in the room. Um, now, this is a little bit of a prediction, but I imagine that will start to change. I think you'll see more and more of it. Um, I was having some very interesting discussions over dinner last night. Universities themselves are getting better at articulating their impact through the Sustainable Development Goal agenda. The University of Manchester very recently, I think it's the first in the UK, it's the second in the world that we're aware of, has released an impact report entirely framed around the SDGs. So every page is one of these 17, and they have looked at all the work that the University of Manchester is doing, its researchers, its outreach into the community and try to describe that impact in, um, in these terms in, um, against the 17. Um, and the reason I think you'll see more and more of it is that governments themselves have to report. The UK had to report back on its progress this year at the UN with 30 or so other countries. Um, and so um, it's, it's one of these um, frameworks that's really gaining momentum and it's worth really being aware of. So, as the ACU, we do various things. We're a grant-giving body, so we uh, hold uh, various scholarship schemes. I've mentioned the Commonwealth Scholarships already, but also Cheeming and Marshall. These are the UK government's three main scholarship schemes that bring scholars from other countries to the UK. Is there anyone in the room who's on one of these scholarships? Last year, there was definitely one Commonwealth Scholar, but not this year, by the looks of things. Um, we also run the Queen Elizabeth Commonwealth Scholarships. In fact, this is a scheme that I run at the ACU. And all of those scholarships are held in other countries, in low- and middle-income countries in the Commonwealth. So they are opportunities for people from the UK, but also the other 52 Commonwealth states to access funding to go and do a master's course in, in one of 20 countries elsewhere in the Commonwealth. We also are a grant uh, receiving organisation for the capacity building work that we do. So uh, this is just um, some statistics to show you some of the reach that we've had recently, um, including climate, uh, climate change early career researchers in Africa. Um, we've also been doing a lot around gender equity. We give grants that allow academics, professional staff, universities to make major changes within their institution to, um, to do real game-changing stuff around gender equity. 
And very recently, we ran the uh, Next Generation Workshop in Nigeria, 170 researchers, um, all doing a, a version of what this brilliant conference at Cumberland Lodge has been doing, thinking about the skills that they need as early career researchers to make sure that their research really does make a change in the wider society. And finally, we do a lot of work on the policy stage. So the reason that we uh, talk about the SDGs quite a lot and the reason I mentioned the UN earlier is it's one of the platforms which really does need reminding about how important research is to global challenges. You may or may not know that the precursor to the SDGs was the Millennium Development Goals. Education wasn't mentioned in that at all, or higher education wasn't mentioned at all. It got passing mention in the sort of framework of the SDGs. So we are there at the table every time reminding all of those policy makers that higher education has a huge contribution to make, of course, to sustainable and um, equitable education, which is SDG 4, but also all of the other SDGs through the research that we've been talking about. And it was a real pleasure to listen to everyone's um, inputs around the, the question about building a utopia later, because it's basically what this is seeking to do. The SDG framework is trying to get us to a much better place, zero poverty, if we mentioned it, eradicating hunger, all of those things are the goals of the, the sustainable development um, agenda. So so it's really important, we think, that policymakers remember the contribution that researchers are contributing and making in that space. These are some of the partners we work with. Even though we're a Commonwealth organization, we work with our equivalents in the Francophony, so the Francophone University is also the International Association of Universities, which cover different parts of the world. Again, if you add us up, we cover most countries um, and nearly 2,000 universities. So it's a, it's, a, it's a powerful voice. We want to make sure that we're heard together. This is not something that we're doing on our own. It's, a, it's for the wider sector. We also work with, obviously, the Commonwealth Secretariat, which is the political um, secretariat for the Commonwealth, Commonwealth of Learning, which is another big education um, distance learning provider within the Commonwealth and the British Council, amongst many other partners, because it's a, it is a global game that we're, we're, we're talking about. One of the things we do is we bring our own universities and academics together around multidisciplinary challenges. Um, two very recent ones are around climate resilience, so the thinking about the role that researchers and universities as institutions, as big employers, as big infrastructures could and should play in helping to mitigate against climate events, uh, major climate events. And also, um, particularly interesting in a Commonwealth context, we do a lot of work around peace and reconciliation. There are some really important lessons to learn and share across um, countries with a shared colonial experience, um, but with very different um, challenges. So if you um, can imagine that this, this, this um, was the first meeting of it in Melbourne, it's led by the University of Melbourne, but if you bring together collaborators from Australia, from Kenya, from South Africa, from the UK, um, from uh, India and Pakistan together talking about peace and reconciliation, you have a very difficult but helpful conversation that is helping to bring uh, conversations forward. So this is a little bit of a segue into how did I get here. <laughs> um, when people ask me uh, at parties what I do, I try and make it sound cooler than it actually is, but I use these two examples, so forgive the cultural references, but the top one is in The Thick of It, which is um, a very funny, um, um, unfortunately quite accurate portrayal of life inside Whitehall or policy-making processes in the UK, highly chaotic, um, often very last minute, um, would still recommend that you watch it. <laughs> it is a bit like that sometimes. Um, these are the people that we work with, that we seek to influence, um, because I work on the government relations side of things. Um, this is the world that I have to interact with. Also, then it rubs on off, off on us a little bit. Uh, the bottom one is the House of Cards. This is Remy. He's a corporate lobbyist um, <laughs> in the US context. Again, it's similar. We do have an agenda. Our agenda is to raise the profile of higher education um, and its contribution to building a better world. We are never hiding that fact, but it does mean that we have to talk to everyone make friends with everyone, be constantly uh, speaking to um, partners across the world. So, so my job is to use all the tools that we have to um, demonstrate the quality um, and importance of research, which usually means bringing researchers rather than me talking to policymakers, bringing them to talk to policymakers. So we bridge that gap between higher education and policy.
So it's a bit of a chaotic slide, but that's also because the route to um, from <laughs> my PhD to the ACU was slightly chaotic. Um, so starting in the top left corner, I did my PhD in medieval history, French and Italian medieval history from the years uh, 930 to around 1140, which is 200 years in two countries. It was narrow in some ways and very broad in other ways um, with a very long title that I would not have used today. Now I've learned how to write slightly differently in my policy context, but I was looking at uh, political structures um, and um, religious, institu religious institutions in the, in the medieval period and how they interacted and tried to improve society. From there, I was really fortunate to have my first working experience at Cumberland Lodge as the, <laughs> so the King George VI Fellow, um, which was brilliant for me because one of the things I hadn't had for my PhD, I felt, particularly doing a subject that didn't really connect to the modern world in a particularly obvious way other than through teaching, um, here at Cumberland Lodge, as you'll know, there is, it's a hugely important space for having really um, difficult discussions about the big ethical challenges of our time. Um, so when I was here, I was confronted with the police service, we worked with the NHS, we worked with wealth inequalities, ageing demographics, these big social issues that made me feel much more connected to the world that I was actually living in than my PhD had made me feel. And I'm not saying that's going to be the same for everyone, particularly listening to some of the subjects that you're doing, it may be a slightly different experience, but I did feel that cloistered experience that people sometimes refer to when they're talking to their about their PhDs. So I had two really wonderful years at the Lodge. I still was an act, uh, active academic. I was publishing from my PhD. I was teaching um, undergraduates and master's students at King's one or two days a week. So I was still working in academia, but I really was really excited by the policy world. I liked the pace of it. I liked the fact that I felt you could actually make a difference or I might be able to make a difference. Um, and it made me realize that, that the next step I wanted to make was actually out of academia and into policy. <laughs> but I wasn't sure that I was credible yet. So I did one key thing, which I think um, was, <laughs> it was a two month project that I was paid 1,000 pounds for um, at the University of Nottingham. But after the lodge, I had two months off between jobs. I did this research project for the University of Nottingham, looking at knowledge exchange policy. It was a big hot topic in the UK research policy space at the time, thinking about how that translated into in what the University of Nottingham might want to think about for its, um, its own strategies internally. And that gave me the credibility then to apply for a proper policy job where I moved to University Alliance. Now that was a mission group of 20 or so universities in the UK and that's where I really started my work trying to be um, someone like Remy from House of Cards. So I was a proper lobbyist in that role. I was mainly there to make relationships within the UK government, again raising the profile of higher education. What I've tried to put in the bubbles is all of the different skills that I had from my PhD already, but I really honed through some of these other experiences. And that these are the sorts of things um, that, uh, that I'm sure you've all spoken about over the course of the last few days with work with Steve and, and so on. Thinking about some of these other skills and how you package them from empl for employers is really important. Um, and looking back, I wasn't ready to do that at the point when I left my PhD, but I certainly was by the time I left Cumberland Lodge. And I moved to the Association of Commonwealth Universities last year, mainly because I became more and more interested in uh, global co cooperation um, rather than just the UK context. So I often get asked what was the transition like. Um, I'm not going to hang around on this for too long, but I wanted to show you um, a word diagram that was created by the King's, um, the King's policy team when they were thinking, um, when they were analysing the last um, research excellence framework, um, which happened in 2014. And they asked academics, what did you do with your research? And it was a whole piece around impact. Um, and if you'll see that, other than work, which I think is quite funny, um, policy was <laughs> probably the next biggest, <laughs> the next biggest um, word on this. So a lot of academics are already working in the policy space. Um, and I wasn't, but when I moved into policy, I found that actually I was surrounded by other academics. And it was really helpful having um, people like, um, with shared languages to me and who could help me make the transition in terms of uh, communication and so on. I would say that for me the biggest uh, shift was language. So as I said, my uh, PhD title was long and wordy and um, it wouldn't be that today. Today it'd be something like why miracles can stop violence or something like that. Something catchy to really grab your attention rather than lots of words that I still actually now can't remember what they mean. Um, but. Um, Language is so important, and I had to learn how to write um, short. So I had to be able to write on one page everything that I wanted to say to a really senior audience. And that means taking leaps that felt uncomfortable to me. I was used to having ev evidence behind everything I said, and you know, you know, reams and reams of footnotes and annexes and data. 
you don't always have an opportunity to do that in policy. You have to make a really convincing argument, but that argument does have to be based on evidence that's elsewhere. So that, for me, was the biggest shift. Um, but other than that, there's lots of similarities. It's talking to people. It's being rigorous with your um, thinking. It's being collaborative, um, and all of those um, sorts of um, skills that we've talked about quite a lot over the last few days. So this is the last slide on, on, on me and my lessons learned, but um, the one thing I'd say is um, don't be precious <laughs> about what a PhD is. Particu this is advice for people who are leaving academia. Um, if you are being interviewed by people who don't know what a PhD is, that's not a problem, but you have to maybe be ready to not even talk about your research at all. It might be possible that you only talk about some examples of time management or collaboration. It's not always true, but I've now interviewed a lot of people and, um, and it's one of the biggest mistakes that people make because you've spent four years doing a particular research area. Of course, you would want to talk about it. It's not always the right thing to do in an interview context to then get you through the gates to then actually go and apply those skills. That's not to say you don't ever do it, but I, was, I, I fell at that hurdle a few times at the beginning. I think that everything you've heard this week and that you're doing already answers some of these or you're already meeting these. Public profiles, feeling confident talking about your um, research, but also your opinions publicly is really important. Um, so blogging, social media, just understanding that um, making a contribution to society means putting your head above the parapet sometimes and talking about things and, and having opinions. Um, I would say don't feel guilty about doing additional activities to research. There hopefully aren't too many research supervisors in the room. It's one of the tussles I hear all the time between PhD researchers and their supervisors. Obviously, there's a lot of work to do, but so many of those additional activities, um, I think Ed was referring to it earlier, help you be that holistic person that makes the fullest contribution to society that you can, so don't feel guilty about doing them. Um, I always say treasure your autonomy. It was the only time, I have to say, during my PhD where no one was telling me what the answer should be. So even now in policy, even if I have to work out what the answer should be, there's always a bigger agenda that's bigger than me. In my PhD, that was the only time where I could find, where I could get as close to the truth as I saw it, um, that I could be. And, and you may find that staying on in academia as well with funding priorities and so on. But, um, but certainly in the world that I live in, I, you know, people pay our salaries. We have to say certain things. We have to achieve certain outcomes. So I do have a bit of a rose-tinted, um, well, sort of, yeah, uh, a view of my PhD period that's actually quite a sort of a sentimental one about autonomy as well. Working style is really important as well because um, I found that actually I work better with small pieces of work that, that happen quickly and I like to see results from what I'm doing in the four-year process of a PhD. Um, I, I did it and I enjoyed it actually, but, um, but I actually pr prefer the snappier sort of results. So that was just something that I fed into my own thinking about career decisions. And obviously, do what you love. Right. Just a few more minutes on, um, on this why a PhD matters. Um, I'm going to quote some research from one of my colleagues at the Commonwealth Scholarship Commission um, who works in the office with us, uh, Susan Morango. I'm going to talk a little bit at the front um, about does a PhD still matter, but she's just doing a piece of work that she hasn't actually published yet, but she's letting me share the results with you. So I haven't actually given references in this, but if people want to email me later, I can, I can share that research when it's published. Um, the reason it's important to, to talk about why a PhD still matters, not only to inspire you and motivate you and make sure that you're, um, you, you, know, you keep going if you're having a bit of a dip in your PhD, it's that um, we work in a, in a world where resources are scarce and we have to make a case for governments, for businesses to invest money in PhDs to allow um, you and others to, 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 to do the research that contributes to society. And it is a very difficult landscape. If you're trying to make a case for PhD funding as opposed to basic education in a country where not everyone goes to school, for example, you have to try really high, um, really hard. There are high unit costs to PhD studies, and there is a, a case to be made. And our answer is always, obviously, you need both, and it has proportional and balanced and according to context, but a case still needs to be made for investment. So. I thought I'd just quickly test whether a PhD still matters. We're making an assumption with why a PhD still matters, but does it matter? Um, and I thought, and does it matter to who? So I looked at two things. I looked at what the market says um, and what governments say. Now, um, unfortunately, there's not very many, um, there's many analyses recently, so this is slightly old data, and they're both from the US context and, um, on the right and US and UK on the left, but you'll, you'll get the point. There is a wage premium to having a PhD. If you look over um, lifetime earnings, this table on the right, 
It's different proportionally, they found, in different subject areas, but all of them have a wage premium, um, opposed to people who just had a bachelor's or a master's. So the market says we value PhDs. Governments also value PhDs. They invest heavily. The UK this year has spent £422 million pounds, um, through the research councils on PhDs. That's before self-funded PhDs. That's before universities themselves invest in PhDs. It's a huge number. Lots of countries in the world have national targets to um, increase the number of PhD um, outputs or graduates. Um, for example, South Africa, by 2030, it wants to have 100 of every 1 million of its population with a PhD, which means it's got to get to 5,000 graduates per year. It's a big investment that the government is making. You'll also see research, not necessarily always PhD students or studentships, but you will see research and research capacity cited in a lot of national development plans. So the research that my colleague at the CSC did was looking at uh, five countries, low-income and fragile states, and looking at their national development plans, and they all have research um, capacity in there as part of the way that they will achieve sustainability in the future. This is another old diagram, but you may have seen it before. It gets used all of the time. I can see <laughs> Steve laughing. I'm sure you've seen this before. This is a Royal Society. It's very controversial these days. But the point of this um, flow diagram shows you that at the front, this is the PhDs, and um, they're science PhDs in this context, coming into the system. And then you see them leaving the system. Now, I have issues with it because some people have interpreted this as a leaky pipeline, which says, look at all these great PhD students that we have in science. And then we only end up with 0.45% of them as professors. Something's gone wrong. Um, now, that is not the way to interpret this. The way to interpret it is, look how lucky society is. You've got 53% of those PhDs going straight in into society. You've got a bunch of them who have had research experience going into society or government or business or wherever. Um, and the point about this is that governments do get that. So governments don't fund lots of PhDs because they only want to have bigger and bigger academic communities. They fund PhDs because they see a wider value to them in society and business in particular. There is one challenge that is worth pointing out in a Commonwealth context particularly. Um, there are some huge shortages of PhD staff as well. Um, so in uh, lots of countries, there's a really burgeoning demand for higher education. Um, uh, I was going to show you the stats, but they're not quite there yet. But I can say 50 to 1 in Uganda is a students to staff ratio, 45 to 1 in Ghana. In Kenya, the numbers are huge because um, H uh, sort of undergraduate demands almost quadrupled in the last decade. This means that you have lots of staff teaching in universities who don't have PhDs. Now, that's not always a problem, but it is a problem when that number is less than a third, which it often is in these countries, the, the, the low-income states that we were looking at. Um, and the problem there is you can't scale up the system at quality because you want to have research-informed teaching in these universities. Not everyone has to be a researcher, but you do need a culture of researchers in that country to, uh, to build the human capacity at undergraduate level. So I just wanted to flag that as an, an area that we are aware of it's one of the things I actually areas where I think international collaboration really can help um, because you can um, inc improve capacity if you if you bring in resources from other countries so if we've established that PhDs do matter why do they matter? Um, again, I've split this down. There are huge benefits for the individual. And it does look like I've just made these up, but I promise you there's some research that sits behind this with a lot of uh, literature. Um, sort of, There's a whole literature review that sits behind this that I can share um, in the future. Um, there are huge benefits for the individual. Um, personal ones. Uh, I've put achievement and pride down there, confidence. It's really important, actually, um, to know that that's a, a benefit because it means that you will be more confident going forward. It means that you will have the uh, credibility that I talked about with Baguma at the beginning, where she was able to speak to policymakers as a researcher, as a, as a doctor. Personal resilience, really, really important. It's one of the characteristics that they find, particularly with PhD students, not just graduates. A lot of this work brings together graduates and postgraduates. This is particularly for PhD students. The rest of it, I think, will, will, will follow through. I think it's fairly um, self-explanatory. But just to say that there are skills, you obviously come with technical skills, um, you, as well as the, the potentially the economic benefits through the, the wage premium that I mentioned, there's just um, the attitude towards building networks and collaboration is really important. Um, and the social value, like today, we were talking earlier about the friends that you've made on this trip. And when you add them all up at the end of your PhD journey, you'll realize how many new contacts and, and, and contacts and friends you've made. Benefits for employers and businesses, as I said, they pay more for PhD students. There is a reason for that. And these are the three areas 
that have been identified by research for uh, the value that employers see. It is the knowledge that is produced, obviously, really important, technical skills, knowledge produced by PhD students. The second, though, is really important to touch on. It's the knowledge transfer. So as I was saying before, it's the ability to translate your research into um, society, into a business, into a partnership, um, which is why the communication aspect of PhDs is always so important to everyone. And also this building and maintaining of networks, the so university business networks um, are viewed by businesses and governments as the sort of road to a, a, a sustainable economic future. There is room for improvement here, though. One of the areas that we've done a lot of work in is actually the university business interaction and, um, and thinking about uh, researchers in, in that context. So it is one area that policymakers are working hard on. Second last slide, um, benefits for countries. The reason that governments invest in PhDs, as I said, is that they want to make sure that their societies are, um, and their growth is knowledge informed. So. Um, both their economies but also societies, and particularly here in the context of the Commonwealth and the international work that I was talking about, countries are so aware of the impact that researchers can have on the particular global challenges that are facing them at the time, and the importance of homegrown or at least home-generated knowledge to help to meet those challenges. So one of the countries we looked at was Bangladesh, huge flooding risks obviously at the moment. So one of the things that the National Development Plan has pinned directly to its own research capacity is the disaster risk management. In Ghana, it's around agriculture and particularly um, fertilizers and how to use uh, them to improve fertilization um, processes in Ghana because of issues that they have there with carcinogenics in the food system, for example. So there are national development plans that link research directly to the specific challenges that countries are having. And obviously there are just wider benefits for society. So I'm going to leave you with one final um, example from our Commonwealth Scholar Network. Um, Oriomi has now held two, actually two separate um, scholarships from us um, and she I found three SDGs that I thought she was directly contributing to and probably many more as well. The problem that Oriomi was looking at um, is actually a very complex one. So um, the availability of affordable housing, tricky. Um, countries, um, I think Nigeria requires about one million more houses every year over the next, um, until 2030, just after 2030. Um, but obviously the construction industry is one of those industries that has a lot of impacts on the environment. There's lots of bad practices around waste, around usage, um, and transport, and things like that. So um, Oriomi's work was actually to build a new um, building block, um, which can be used um, in housing. It's made of waste paper, 75% of waste paper, and um, a byproduct from the dairy industry that replaces cement. So it's two waste products, products brought together. Its thermal capacity is better, actually, that she, she's tested it now better than the cement-based ones, which are very bad for the environment. Um, and it can be transported easier, it's lighter, um, and uh, used to build houses more quickly. So sh she, through her lab-based research, has created something which hopefully will really help contribute um, in her home country of Nigeria towards a particular problem, but also way beyond Nigeria as well. The important thing about Oriomi is she's also working with small and medium-sized enterprises now. She's looking at other waste materials. She's looking at ceiling panels. She's thinking about other ways that she can spread the work out. She's not trying to do it all herself, but she is understanding that her role as a scientist and an entrepreneur will open up spaces for, for more and better uh, work in this space. Again, not everyone's PhD's examples will be so immediately impactful, but it is really helpful to know, I think, that all of us, all of the work that you've done in your PhDs or are doing in your PhDs, are contributing to society either tomorrow, either next week or next year, and there is something, um, there's always a story you can tell. So my one sort of takeaway from you for, 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 from this presentation, I think, would be to think about the way that you articulate that impact, the language you use, the people you speak to, I think I'm reinforcing a lot of messages you've heard this week anyway, um, but I was hoping that some inspirational stories of, of how it can be done and, and done quite quickly um, would also send you off on your journeys later today feeling inspired to, to go to work on Monday. So that's everything. <laughs>